Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, we want to share with you um, our thoughts and our vision on a topic uh, we believe is very important for the quantum computing community. How should we think about and how should we design the control stack in order to accelerate the timeline towards useful and impactful quantum computers? The quantum world is very rich. So is the world of today's quantum processing units or QPUs. There are different types of qubits, different architectures of QPU, different ways to perform the gates, and new ideas and realizations come up every day. And every QPU needs different controls. There are different types of control signals, different frequencies, different modulation waveforms, different time, constra time constraints, and again, new ideas which are, uh, of course, key towards fast progress keep coming up. But eventually, all QPUs and their controls need to serve the same purpose, of course, to store and process quantum information very abstractly. So no matter how we physically implement the qubits um, and their controls, we want to eventually, after a set of calibrations and optimizations, to think about our qubits uh, in the most standard and abstract terms of quantum information and quantum computation. So basically, as complex vectors on which we perform unitary operations. So in view of this, how should we think about designing the control stack to accelerate the timeline towards practical quantum computers? Well, we can make only the top layer, um, the, the application layer, or the most uh, high level programming language layer common to all QPUs. And one could claim that uh, this gives the most freedom to optimize the most along the entire stack. But there is a big problem with this and that there is so much learning and development that we need to do um, and th 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 that basically spending years of development on a control system that is too specific could lead to significant waste and could slow down the progress dramatically. And if we don't build components, tools, and interfaces across the entire stack, that are general and flexible enough for different QPUs, uh, different architectures, different types of qubits, different controls, then we seriously risk first the critical flexibility that is needed to explore new developments. Second, the possibility to create an R&D community that shares knowledge and reuses uh, already developed uh, components. And third, uh, and very important, uh, are common low-level interfaces, both in the software and the hardware, uh, which allow uh, for a more diverse ecosystem with different players that can uh, build different products and solutions and services in all different layers of the stack. So this includes benchmarking, optimization, op automation, application, etc. So what if we could use the commonalities between the different QPUs and their needs? And fortunately, there are commonalities as we will see in the workshop today to achieve these advantages and to accelerate the time uh, towards realizing useful quantum technologies. What if we could build a platform flexible enough to address the significant uncertainty in the development of quantum computing? What should a, such a control stack look like? Well, first, it should support all QPUs, and very importantly, it should be versatile enough to allow us to optimize uh, the performance for each different QPU. Second, it must provide a great developer experience that maximizes productivity so that we can move at the, at the fastest rate. And third, it should include open source software for creating a larger community, and it must enable easy integrations with all the tools and components uh, in the community for creating a rich ecosystem, again, with many players working on, on many different components. So this is the task that we took upon ourselves at Quantum Machine. To develop such a platform with these design principles in mind, and in order to provide a, a valuable tool that allow research and development to progress, again, at the fastest rate. So at QM, we are a team of physicists and engineers. Uh, we have people on the team who worked on basically any quantum system out there, superconducting qubits, quantum dots, uh, spin qubits, NV centers, trapped ions, neutral atoms, etc. And we are very passionate about building the best control solutions for the quantum computing community. 
We developed what we call the quantum orchestration platform, which is an integrated hardware and software uh, system that allows you essentially to do three things. First, to run the most advanced experiments. Second, to run these experiments on a variety of QPUs at any scale. And third, to do that all from a super intuitive programming language, a programming language that we call QA. So what makes it all possible? First, we develop dedicated hardware. The hardware has a scalable analog front end with analog inputs and output channels for generating the control waveforms and measuring signals, and where all this, the channels uh, can be fully synchronized with ultra low jitter and noise performance. And moreover, uh, where many modules can be connected and synchronized together to form a large and scalable system. Now, at the heart of this dedicated hardware, we have the most important part of the technology, which is our pulse processor. So this is a true processor, uh, not, not an improved measurement device uh, with be better software. It's, it's really a true processor, just like uh, the CPU or GPU in your computer, with a full and comprehensive instruction set. So that's the, basically the language that the processor can digest and run. And it's a new kind of processor that has an architecture and an instruction set uh, which we des design specifically and optimized for quantum control. So what does it mean? Well, the processor combines together the four elements that uh, must be involved in every quantum control protocol. The first one is waveform generation. So generating the pulses uh, that perform the operations on the quantum system. And this includes not only generating waveforms, but also shaping them in real time uh, and changing the parameters. So uh, for example, amplitudes, frequencies, phase, phases, stretching pulses, chirping frequencies, et cetera. So that's the first element. The second element is waveform acquisition and processing. So measuring signals coming back from the quantum system, the quantum processor, and processing them to infer information about the state of the quantum system. So this is all done in the pulse processor in real time. The third component is classical processing. And here is where this platform is truly different from any other device out there, because you can perform completely general classical processing from tracking arrows in real time, performing real time Bayesian estimations, scanning pulse parameters, etc. You can do it in the most general sense. And finally, the fourth element control flow. So if else statements, for loops, while loops, switch cases, and more. So you can have uh, the most general control flow with branching of the program, uh, nested loops, subroutines, um, and such. So you can run on the pulse processor any combination, any quantum program that involves a combination of these four elements, as, as we will see later on today in the examples. And so this is the pulse processor. And on top of that, we developed a language, again, a, a very intuitive pulse level control programming language that we call QA. So you write your quantum program in QA, and then our compiler takes care of all the uh, nitty gritty uh, optimizations um, and uh, so, so that you get the best performance running on the pulse processor. All right, so today in, in today's workshop, we're going to see many examples of using QA and the quantum orchestration platform. But here is an overview of some of the main components of the, the language that you will see also later on in the examples. So first, we can play passes to elements in the quantum processor, as well as perform measurements, of course. Uh, these are the quantum operations, right? Uh, the quantum operations um, that we perform on the quantum system. Second, we can define completely general classical variables like the, this, this A and this B here. And we can perform completely general classical processing with these variables and, and use them in our circuit. And this is really what makes QA unique. So it interleaves these classical operations and these quantum operations in the same code, and it all runs in real time. This is shown in the next point where we can uh, use these classical variables as the parameters of, of the pulse. Here, uh, we modify the amplitude or the duration of a pulse according to uh, the, the classical variables here, A and B. Now, another critical component is that these classical variables can also be fed by measurements, um, measurements of the quantum system. 
So here, for, for example, we measure a qubit or a resonator, and the result after processing the, the signal, uh, after here doing the demodulation and integration, the result uh, goes into this variable i right here at the end of this line. And this i can, can then be uh, continuously processed. So, so here you see uh, another variable, state, which is a Boolean variable, and we say state equals i larger than some threshold, some number, which is actually here, this is state discrimination. And so we measure two variables and then we can keep processing them. And then next we can do control flow, which again can be based on this classical variable. So for example, if state play uh, a pass to some qubit or while we measure some error syndrome, we keep doing something and so on. So you see now that feedback becomes trivial with quant, since you simply measure your qubit into a classical variable and then use this variable to control uh, to, to control the flow of the program or modify a pulse parameter. And finally, uh, we have full timing control with sync and async multi-threading. So you can define different threads, syn synchronize them um, and, 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 and any way you want. All right, so how does this work or how does it look like in reality? So you have uh, your quantum device or QPU, whether it's a superconducting qubit chip or uh, a spin, a spin qubit uh, quantum dots based chip in a dilution refrigerator, or whether uh, it's trapped ions or tweezer arrays in a vacuum chamber or any other quantum device, uh, you connect it to our dedicated control hardware. So each one of these modules here is called the OPX and it has the analog front end and the pass processor that we discussed. And as you can see also, many such modules, many OPXs can be connected and can form a single uh, unit, a single controller with a single pulse processor. So all the pulse processor actually communicate between one another and they form a single pulse processor. So you connect all the controllers to your quantum device and all the controllers can be connected to our server layer. And then anyone on the net network of the server can connect to the system. Then the first thing that, that we do is we define uh, a configuration file for what we call a quantum machine. So here you see three different quantum machines, QM1, QM2, and QM3. And once you define the configuration of these quantum machines, um, again, anyone from the client uh, side can connect to uh, these quantum machines and could run qua programs on these machines. All right, so I hope this gives you a high level perspective on why we believe such a versatile control platform uh, is needed in the community and, 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 and what we believe such a platform uh, should look like. And in the rest of the workshop, we're going to deep dive into specific examples and use cases that demonstrate how the quantum orchestration platform and the design principles that, that, that we talked about, the design principles behind this platform can serve the community and push the field forward. So in the first session, we will first look at an example of how the quantum orchestration platform or, or the QOP gives an out of the box solution to a new platform that uses only microwave signals to control trap ions, showing basically that we can optimize performance for this new platform without any extra new hardware and software development. So when we, when we uh, first encountered this uh, new platform, we were very happy that we, we designed the system to be flexible enough that you can really optimize for this new platform that did not exist. Um, and this talk will be given by, by uh, Miri Brook, uh, who is leading our product team at QM. And then Gal Winner, who is leading our libraries team, will discuss another example that basically shows how one could share code among different QPUs of completely different types. So this is another great example for how the, the flexibility of the system could allow us to create a community even for different QPUs and share code. Then we have the second session where we will uh, first have a talk by Leo Ela, who's leading our research team at QM, and by Arthur Strauss, our super quantum engineer, uh, about quantum error correction. Um, and this, this really demonstrates how the, the QOP provides an extremely powerful tool for exploring quantum error correction codes directly from software, while still managing to give unmatched real-time performance. 
So at QM, we actually strongly believe that this is one of the most important applications of the QOP, since quantum error correction codes uh, really are, are just now starting to be implemented on actual quantum device. Um, and there is a lot of exploration that must be done on this very, very critical topic. So having the flexibility to do that from software while still giving the, the, the performance is, is one of the key aspects of the QOP. And the second talk in this second session is uh, also going to be given by, by Arthur Strauss, um, and it will focus on variational algorithms and their control needs. Um, and it will also demonstrate how the control platform should allow us to explore near-term algorithms and, and push the capabilities uh, of current QPUs towards applications. And finally, our uh, third session will focus on real-time classical feedback, not just uh, in the middle of the quantum circuit, but also for preparation and calibrations of, of, of the system. So here we have a special guest speaker, Will Gilbert, uh, who is an electrical engineer in the group of Professor Andrew Durack at the University of South Wales in Australia, uh, which is working on developing spin qubits and scalable paths towards uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. And Will is going to uh, talk about a new and very exciting uh, result from uh, their lab where they use the QOP to perform feedback-based uh, frequency tracking. So this is going to be an exciting talk. And finally, Ramon uh, Smook is going to, uh, are, 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 uh, to talk about um, um, atom array sorting using the quantum orchestration platform. Ramon is our quantum atom experts and product leader. Um, and this is a great example, again, for the flexibility of the quantum orchestration platform, not just to perform uh, the quantum control sequence, but also to prepare and sort the atoms, uh, in this case, in a, in a very efficient and very elegant, again, highly flexible, uh, highly programmable manner. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it now to Mary, uh, who, will, who is going to talk about the first example of controlling uh, ions with uh, microwave signals. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, uh, so thank you for joining. Um, I will show an example that I find very interesting of um, how one can, sorry, one can use uh, the QOP as uh, Jonathan just uh, explained, uh, straight out of the box for a new emerging qubit control approaches. You can think of an idea and just implement it using the QOP. The use case in this talk is how to generate a bell state and measure its fidelity in trapped ions with laser-free control schemes. Uh, so as, as uh, Jonathan showed before, there are different types of qubits and architectures, and new ideas and realizations come up every day. So I will focus on the trapped ions, uh, uh, on the trapped ions and give some example of traditional uh, ion control that is based on optical signals and then a focus on novel implementation recently published in Nature of laser-free control. Great. Um, so trapped ions pose an excellent platform for quantum uh, computing as they show record uh, qubit coherence time, high gate fidelities, and all-to-all -all connectivity. And there are various techniques uh, to call how one can uh, cool and localize atoms in the lab, sorry, ions in the lab. And here are some uh, outstanding examples you can see over here. Uh, where now the challenges of laser scaling up and speeding up the operations are common to all these implementations. For example, in the top left uh, image taken from Innsbruck, they implemented a um, high optical access trap, which they place inside a cryogenic system, right? Um, they did it because they want to reduce magnetic field noises. This is what the cryogenics gives us. But in order to maintain the high optical accessibility to the ions, which you need for single qubit addressing, um, making this optical setup was extremely challenging, right? They have lenses that are placed inside a vacuum chamber in the cryogenic system in order to be able to tightly focus the laser beams on the ions, which you must have for individual addressing. Uh, so this is just one example. You can see others over here. Now, in addition to the complexity of the setup and the technical difficulties um, each, each such setup has, laser-induced noises are the most significant contributor to the error budget, which limits the fidelity of state-of-the-art qubits. 
Um, and these noise actually, you cannot, you, you can mitigate them, but they are inherent properties of every optical qubit control uh, platform. For example, here are two different experiments. One is pretty recent, uh, the other one is older, but actually all, all, all error budget, um, if, if you keep count of your error budget in an optical control system, you will always uh, end up with laser intensity and phase fluctuations. In this experiment, for example, it's about almost order of magnitude larger than the second contributor to your error budget, um, and also off resonance photon scattering. Uh, one way to tackle this, uh, these laser induced noises is to consider a non optical qubit control. For example, you can, you can use the hyperfine splitting of, of a level of an atom to, uh, in presence of magnetic field uh, as the qubit up and down state, zero and one, whatever. Um, and, and this will, by doing so, you can control the qubit with microwave frequency rather than optical frequencies. Um, so say I have an ion trapped in my lab. Uh, and I decide I want to experiment uh, with, with uh, hyperfine transitions instead of optical ones, okay? What do I need to do in order to do so? Of course, I will need to adjust my setup. It will be significant work, but this is what physicists do, right? Um, but, but I'll tell you what I don't need to do. I don't need to redevelop my control system. And this is pretty cool. I can take the QOP, which until now I've used for optically induced transitions, and very, very simply, almost out of the box, to mod modify it to have microwave control, okay? And this is more or less what I wanna show you today in this, uh, in this example. Now, before we dive into the example, let me briefly explain how we achieve entanglement in ions. I don't know um, uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with it. So let me do it really quickly. Okay, so the entangling interaction required for universal control typically relies on uh, effective qubit to qubit coupling, which is mitigated by the shared motions of the ions in the trap. Say it's a, a harmonic potential trap, the ions can move either together in phase or out of phase. Okay, and I will use this motion in, to, to create the entanglement. This is how I will do that. So the harmonically confined ion has internal spin state, which we can label as down and up or zero and one. In addition, it has motion of state, which is which denoted here by N, separated by uh, this frequency, which is determined mostly uh, determined by the uh, trap parameters. In the abs absence of any spin-dependent gradients, the, excite the only excitation pulse that can drive spin flips uh, is, the, is that that leaves the ion motional state unchanged. Meaning, if I don't have any uh, gradient fields. I will be able to only do spin flips with n equals zero transition involving no mo motion whatsoever, right? This is shown here in green. However, if I do have this uh, displacement, I do have uh, a gradient displacement of the ground state relative to the up state, we can have sideband transitions of delta n equals zero and one, um, sorry, minus one and one. And we can do a blue, blue sideband transition. What does it do? It, mo it moves from uh, it move, it's moving the ion from down with no motion to up and one quanta motion. On the contrary, we can have red excitation where the motional and external degrees of freedom are exchanged. So going from ground to excited will be with expense of one motional uh, quanta. Great, uh, now uh, if I take the blue sideband and I stop it midway, I don't complete the entire cycle, but I stop the blue sideband I can create a symmetric bell state. And that is a very interesting bell state that entangles the state, the internal uh, degree of freedom of the ion and the external one, the motion. Um, and this is exactly the spin motion coupling that we aim for. I will in a minute show you how this is, uh, how this can be extended to two atoms, two ions. I come from atoms, I'm sorry. Um, great. Uh, in a similar manner, when I do full red sideband excitation, it, it takes the initial superposition of internal degrees of freedom and turns it into superposition of motional degree of freedom, right? And I can do it back and forth. And these are actually the two things that I need to do in order to do entanglement. And this is how. So let's imagine we have two ions and we want to entangle them. And I place them uh, in, in one trap. So they share the external degrees of freedom, right? As I said, they're moved together either in phase or out of phase. 
Now, the common state of the ion can be described like this as down. Uh, this is the left ion, the right ion, and their shared um, motion. Here, they will start with zero motion. Next, I can apply um, timed blue sideband, meaning I stop it midway, right, on the left ion. And it, it will entangle its internal state and the motion. Next, I can apply red sideband on the right ion, swapping its motion and the internal degrees of freedom. Full red uh, sideband takes an initial superposition of the motion, which we had here, and turns it into a superposition of internal degrees of freedom, generating two ion bell state, right? This is exactly what I wanted. When the, and the motion uh, can be uh, tensored out of the equation. Um, in order to realize this scheme, this is the bell state is, is, is what we aim for. In order to realize uh, this coupling, we need to have single ion addressing, addressing and control fields at the ion position that have uh, strong spatial gradients to allow to, this uh, entanglement to be efficient, right? In order to couple the ion internal degree of freedom and position. Um, right. So in the traps that I showed you before and the standard uh, way of implementing such coupling and entanglement, uh, people use gradients which are ge generated using laser fields, laser light actually. Yeah. This is the scheme that we've seen in the traps uh, I showed you before. Uh, where we end up with the challenges of laser induced noise. Okay, now keeping this uh, scheme in mind, let's see how the how a, a alternative approach of microwave qubit control, which is laser, which is free of such noises, uh, uh, can be implemented. And uh, here I will show a work uh, done in NIST and lately uh, published in Nature from the Daniel Schlichter uh, group, um, which shows high fidelity universal control of two trapped ion qubits uh, and, and, and everything. And the qubit control was done only with microwave qubit drive. Um, it's not that they, it's not completely laser free because still all the cooling and trapping and also readout is done by laser, but the qubit operations, the one that are sensitive to uh, decoherence is done without lasers. So th that, that's really the goal. So here they show, uh, their, they benchmark their fidelity of the Bell state compared to previously previous work. So um, the, the signals over here are the average, are, are, are the fidelity and here is the error. And you see that they really pushed uh, the limit. And this is a record fidelity to both uh, laser-based implementations and previous work used laser-free implementations. The advantage here on top of just pushing the fidelity uh, higher is to speed up the operations, okay? Speed up uh, the microwave based. So this is really cool work. And I wanna show you how um, we can, we can implement the control scheme of this uh, th that was used to, to, to uh, reach these fidelities with the QOP. Great, so what, what, what's going on here? Let's take a look on the setup. So these guys cool and trap to magnesium uh, 25 ion in a surface electrode trap. Here is just the central part of the trap. It has, still has all the apparatus around it. And the entanglement interaction is generated by the megahertz and gigahertz currents, which are driven along the qubit electrodes control over here. These are uh, numbered one, two, and three. And these are the frequencies uh, the, that are used for, to generate these fields. Now, in order to have uh, individual ion addressing, the ion crystal is slightly uh, rotated uh, with respect to the trap axis, such that the two ions experience different AC Zeeman shift. I may not, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but they are using a hyperfine transition, which is magnetic field sensitive, which is sensitive to magnetic field. And since we have a gradient over here that will go in like this, okay, or like this. So each qubit feels different. Uh, effective magnetic field, hence its AC Zeeman shift will be different. Now, so what do I need from my control system in order to implement a scheme which is based on these uh, frequencies? I'm not going into the, the details of how exactly it creates, creates the entanglement, but it is based on the components I showed you before of red and blue sidebands. It's exactly what we have here. And this is the displacement gradient, which makes the up and down state have a uh, 
allow actually sideband transitions. Okay, so it's it's all the components, but we won't go into more much more details. Okay. Okay, so what do I need uh, control-wise to create, uh, to use these fields to create the entanglement? First of all, I need to have an oscillating magnetic field at this frequency, at five megahertz. Okay, um, I want to, I want to create, I want to control the relative amplitude and phases of all these fields, one compared to the other, right? If I want to create an amp and, and a gradient, meaning the amplitude and of the field on electrode one needs to be different than electrode two, different than electrode three, right? Because I want to create the gradient. Um, in addition, I want to have the qubit drive, which is in a near the qubit transition frequency of up down and e n equals zero, and uh, to allow red and blue sideband transitions indicated over here. In addition, everything needs to be fully synchronized and have phase coherence. So all these, uh, whoever's generating this, need to have a shared clock. Right, it's quite it's quite a, a challenge control wise, and indeed it, it, the implementation doesn't look uh, so straightforward out of the box. This is how these guys um, implemented the control for this experiment. Uh, so one, two, and three are the one, two, three electrodes from the trap, and um, we see the electronics for the, that they use for the qubit control. Um, so I won't go into the details of the digital and analog components here, but you can see that they had to use different circuits for every frequency tone generation. Make sure they all have a common clock for phase coherence, manufacture all of these, and finally figure out how to program all of it to generate a very specific sequence, okay? Um, next, I wanna show you how easy everything can be with the QOP and clock. So just please take a look. Um, I can take the OPX, replace all these costume-made uh, boards with one box and just properly connect it, okay? So, um, so I can take these six ducts that I showed you before. And most, and most of the parts of the, and the analog components can be replaced by one OPX control, controller. So three outputs will go, go for the field gradient. Three pairs of IQ, three IQ pairs for the qubit control. Uh, so one for qubit control and two sidebands. And in addition, uh, the same OPX can be used to trigger the readout. Okay, I can trigger the camera and also send an analog signal for the acoustic optic modulator, which controls the fluorescence laser. So in exactly 10 analog outputs and one digital channel, I can have the full experimental control. This is pretty cool. Now, uh, okay, so we have the frequency tones, we generated them, we sync them, and we connect them to the electrodes. Now we need to generate the sequence, right, in order to create the entanglement uh, with this record fidelity that I showed you before and, and showed right here. So let's see how elegantly the sequence can be written, iterated over, and optimized with quark. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look on a such building block of four frequency tones, Y4. We have one, two, three, four. Um, the magnetic field gradient, the red and blue sidebands, and qubit drive at omega zero over here. Um, also, please know that the, this omega g needs to go to three electrodes. So actually I have here uh, seven, okay? So how will it look uh, in quark, okay? So first of all, we'll define the duration um, of each of, of, of the different parts. So we have rising and, fall, rising and falling edges. Um, and this, uh, according to the authors, sine square is, is the function they want to use for the rising and falling edge. And we have the constant duration, okay? Next, we define the entangling operation as a function. And uh, this is a Python function, function embedded in QA code. Uh, and its variables are the duration of the pulse, the amplitude of the magnetic field uh, gradient at each one of the electrodes, okay? Um, and this metaprogramming approach is very convenient, right? As the code is so, uh, compact and easy to work with, and you will see it in a minute. And if I have this function uh, definition, I can use it wherever I want. Excellent. Now let's start playing the pulse. So I play this uh, rising edge of the sine square to all three magnetic field gradient uh, electrodes, okay? With the amplitude, which can be, uh, which are parametric, right? Uh, next, I use the align command. Uh, before I play the const part of the pulse, 
So it will play only after all the play commands uh, of the rising and falling of the rising uh, edges uh, had finished. Okay, I want first of all to finish all this. Sorry, and then play the cons part. Now, um, in this example, um, I have this cons part over for seven, 70 uh, microseconds, but I, but I can have it actually as long as I want, okay? Because please note that um, everything here is parametric. So in order to represent um, a constant, I only need one number, right? And I can have it now, I'm not limited by anything. I can, in the, um, this, so, so the const, for example, is very, of course, easy to represent. I can also um, easily modify this sine square rising edge by also changing one parameter, which is the sampling rate, which will allow me to uh, squeeze and stretch this uh, square sign. Uh, and actually I can change any parameter of this sequence. And, and check my performance without rewriting the code and without waiting for the program to be uploaded again from my PC to the controller, okay? Because everything is parametric. So I can optimize over every parameter here uh, very, very easily. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, next we play, uh, we again play the, we, we ramp everything down. Uh, and this is, uh, Yes, this is how it looks in reverse. We ramp it up, of course, in reverse order. Um, now, uh, I want to show you, uh, I want to combine everything into a sequence and play it in a, in a loop, right? Because I have not just one uh, such iteration, but eight. Um, okay, I also have um, these pi pulses over here uh, at omega zero, which correct for qubit frequency offsets and uh, drifts. And I need to carry them out exactly when I'm, but I'm not playing anything else. Uh, so the qubit frequency is not AC Zeeman shifted while I do that correction. And using, and here you can see the code exactly how the loops are um, are implemented. And I'm, and the compiler is making sure that I play the pi pulses exactly when I want them, and there are no overlaps between pi pulses and and, and any other uh, frequency that is playing in the background. Excellent. Now let's see how we combine it all together to generate a measurement sequence. So for example, to generate uh, this kind of a plot which shows, um, which shows the Bell state infidelity versus qubit frequency offset. Um, and this will give us the right value for the, the, this omega tilde over here, which is not exactly the omega, uh, the omega zero, but I have some offset for optimization, for experimental optimizations. And um, so this, this graph is very important to generate in order to just continue with the, with the experiment. So let me show you uh, how one can do that in Qua. So I can just define the range of the offsets that we want to scan. Um, and here it was, this is the range. It can be anything actually. And uh, we want to decide which phase to add to which electrode, okay? Uh, in order to uh, optimize the magnetic field, a, and, and its effect on the qubits. I want to have uh, a individual phase control for every electrode. And here we can have it. So I, I, I decide over the phase and just assign it. I can update the frequency and update the phase of the qubit in real time, okay? So I just do that before I play my entanglement se uh, sequence. And, uh, and, but this code actually can generate such a plot which will eventually give me the estimation of my qubit fidelity. So we have, yeah, this, this example showed real-time phase and frequency updates. Um, so let me just summarize. We showed a um, pretty cool exper experiment, very recently published in Nature. Uh, we showed its uh, complex control scheme. And then um, I showed you a suggestion of how such control scheme can be simplified and how uh, a lab can get that just out of the box with OPX and how the experimental flow and sequence can be uh, parameterized and optimized using QA. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, next, uh, Gal will tell you about a, a different way to benchmark performance. Here it was just it was simple, it was fidelity measurements. Gal will show a more complicated way of benchmarking qubit performance and 
on, on a specific platform and then also uh, tell you how it can be implemented even to this novel technique that I've just shown you over here. Thank you. Thank you, Mili. Uh, so you can see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah great. Okay, uh, hi everyone, and thanks again to Miri. Uh, I'm Gal, and I'm going to speak about something quite different to what uh, Miri just showed us. Uh, to begin with, I'm going to focus on a different qubit platform, superconducting qubits. And instead of showing you a specific experiment, what I'm going to do is to speak about some techniques for measuring the fidelity or quality of an operation on a quantum bit. The reason you need to measure this is that the quality of qubits is crucial to getting them to do useful things. Uh, this slide that I took from uh, John Martinez shows the quality of a qubit on this axis and uh, the quantity of them on this other axis. And you want to be in this green area at the bottom right if you want to do interesting things like taking advantage of quantum error correction. But if you're above some error rate, no matter how many qubits you have, it'll never be useful. And this begs the question of how do you quantify this rate? Now, before I answer this question, I want to give the shortest possible introduction to superconducting qubits, just to make sure we're on the same page. So the superconducting qubit concept is one of the pioneering practical realizations of a qubit, and certainly one of the most popular ones currently. A superconducting qubit is a lot like a driven RLC electrical circuit, meaning it's an oscillator. A classical harmonic oscillator has equally spaced energy levels, like in this left diagram, but it's not a qubit as the energy levels are not individually addressable. In a superconducting qubit, a nonlinear element made of a superconducting material, it's called the Josephson junction, modifies the oscillator slightly from harmonicity. This is shown in the blue diagram on the right, and the energy levels are no longer equidistant, and this gives us a qubit. The difference in energy between these levels is typically in the, in the gigahertz range, which is roughly speaking the microwave part of the spectrum. So the theory of measuring the superconducting qubit has some technical details if we really need to explain it, but I'd rather not go into that right now. So in practice, what is done is to play a microwave pulse into a wire that's connected to a resonator, which is coupled to the qubit. That's what's happening here. And then this pulse is reflected from the resonator and goes in a different way as it comes back through the cir circulator. So when the pulse reaches the measurement system, the reflected power and phase are, can be measured. And in RF engineering, these are very standard things to measure uh, using homodyne techniques. And this is the resulting measurement. You see that the drive frequency is here on, along this line. And if the, I mean, if the frequency is along this line, you have a big difference in phase depending on the state of the qubit. So this phase can be directly measured by demodulating the reflected signal. So now that we know more than enough about superconducting qubits for the purpose of this talk at least, we should note one of the best things about them is that they're an okay technology for scaling up, though it's probably not the best. And there are many, there are quite a few many qubit systems out there. I show here um, two current examples, uh, one from the University of uh, Science and Technology in China with 66 qubits and the other is this famous bristle cone from Google that has 72 qubits. And below you can see that the IBM roadmap going from an order of maybe 100 qubits today to uh, over 1,000 qubits by 2023. And, and they have really grand plans for what's going to come after that. So going back to our story about noise and errors, we need to also remind ourselves of how to describe a noisy quantum system. Now, a great to tool to do this is the language of density matrices. And a density matrix can describe a more general type of quantum system whose state is a statistical mixture of pure, uh, of pure quantum states. So noise processes can stir these mixtures up, and this is something that we want to characterize. So how can we figure it out? What's the process by which one can see how the density matrix is modified? So one that way to do this is process tomography, but before we explain that, let's speak about something that may be a bit simpler, which is state tomography. The state tomography is a way to figure out a quantum state. It assumes you can generate the same quantum state many times and measure each copy independently. It's like taking many pictures from different angles to assemble the whole object. And that's exactly what is shown uh, here in this CAT scan of a brain. This is classical. But on this image, what you see is a block sphere with a state of a qubit uh, here in this white uh, dot. And as you go from left to right, you measure this system in different bases uh, on different copies of the qubit. You first measure in, uh, let's say, uh, a right-handed uh, in a circular uh, basis, and 
you place the qubit somewhere in this plane, then you can measure in a diagonal basis and then uh, the qubit is now known to be somewhere on this line. Finally, you can measure in the horizontal vertical basis and uh, you get and you get and you pin pin down the state of the qubit uh, uh, completely. So in this version of the image, the effect of uncertainty is illustrated and this pins the qubit down instead of to a point, some region on the sphere and not an exact point, which is a more, which gives a better picture of how things uh, look like. So how do you do the same, same thing, but instead of figuring out the state, you get the process, meaning the effect of the computation. So here's a mathematical way to describe it. Uh, for some process epsilon, you need to select a basis set of operators E sub i and just see what they do to different realizations of the density matrix. I'm glossing over many details here, but they can all be found out in standard texts like on Mike and Ike or similar. But this is called the Chi matrix representation of process tomography. And it reduces the problem of figuring out the entry, uh, of figuring out the process to figure out the entries of this matrix, Psi M N. So is it easy to do? Uh, no, of course not. It's not easy at all. So the number of entries in this matrix scales as the dimension of the Hilbert space D to the power four. So for a single qubit with dimension two Hilbert space, you have 12 entries to determine. For two qubits, uh, you have 240. And for sycamore, you have many. Uh, you just can't do it in practice. So if you have one qubit, it's doable. And what you need to do is to perform the experiments shown here. So you need to prepare the qubit in the zero state and, and measure it, and then prepare it in the one state and measure it again. Then you prepare it in the Fourier basis, so in these plus and minus states and measure it. And for each of these, you need to repeat the process many times to get good statistics. So let's see how to do that using our programming language, Qua. And what, what I'm showing here is a snippet of the code, but you can find the full thing on our GitHub repo. Uh, you can Google it, or you can use this QR code here if you want to uh, look at it. So we have this for loop, like Miri showed us before, that's wrapping a few macros. Uh, these are the Z tomography, Y tomography, and X tomography lines. So this is a loop running in hardware, like Miri said before, the system doesn't upload some big chunk of code before everything, everything starts and waits for the result. It's a loop that can run once or a million times with no difference in overhead. Now, each of the macros in the body of the loop performs one of the measurements that we saw on the previous slide. So look at, looking inside one of the macros, as an example, we see additional macros. So it's a bit of a rabbit hole situation. But nevertheless, using these makes the description of the algorithm nicely encapsulated and much easier to follow. So note I said macro, not a function. And I want to take a moment and explain this, even though it was explained before as well. So max, macros are an example of metaprogramming. So this is a technique that has various features, but here it means you use one programming language to generate another. Use Python to write Qua. The Qua compiler evaluates the macros at compile time. So they're effectively replaced by Qua code before things are sent to hardware. By using macros, you can build generic descriptions of the code. So this is an independent, each one is an independent com component like a piece of Lego. And if you look back at the code that I showed you in the previous slide, nothing so far has any mention at all of the type of qubit we're working with. So this technique of macros is one of the important pieces that makes Qua a cross-platform language. So if you go down the rabbit hole of all these macros, you end up seeing some real Qua commands. Here you see um, a, a, a macro that sets the phase of the pulses that you play in this frame rotation is not a macro, it's an actual quad command. And here you see a pulse being played, uh, a pi pulse played to some qubit. And these quad commands are translated into instructions that are understood by our pulse processor, the core of our computation. Similarly, this is a measurement. Uh, so when, when, the, when we perform a state measurement, what we do is use a measure command that is able to do the demodulation of the reflected signal and extract the phase as I showed mentioned before when I spoke about how to measure a superconducting qubit. And, and in fact, this is practically the only place the whole tomography script where, where the fact we're targeting a superconducting qubit, qubit plays any important role. So for large systems, 
Process tomography is impractical, as we said, and it has some additional drawbacks I didn't mention. Uh, for example, it's highly dependent upon state preparation and measurement errors, or SPAM, as they're called in the business. And instead, the gold standard in characterizing a process on a real qubit in the past decade or so has been randomized benchmarking. So when you see a gate fidelity quoted on a paper, it most probably was RB or some close cousin of, I, of RB. And the idea is to randomly generate a circuit made of a certain type of a gate, um, commonly uh, a Clifford, and I'll say what that means in a bit, and operate on that circuit on a given input state. Uh, so this is what uh, uh, this circuit looks like. You have these uh, randomly selected Cliffords. And after each Clifford, you keep track of where you expect the system to be, which state you expect it to be in. And um, as a final step, at the end, you apply the gate that takes that state that you expect the system to be in back to your original state. This is called the recovery gate. Now, the number of Cliffords you use is potentially very large, and uh, it may need to go into the hundreds if your qubits are good. This is one of the big challenges. Uh, you then measure the system and many times to see how well, on average, you really do get back to the starting position. And what you typically, typically end up with is this type of decaying exponential with a decay rate that's indicative of the average, average fidelity per Clifford. So there are two main challenges in running an RB protocol. And the first one is generating this deep circuit made of Clifford sampled from the group with uniform probability. If you need to prepare this ahead of time, you need to upload a long sequence to the memory of your signal generator each time you run the experiment. Uh, and just as a little spoiler, of course, this is not how we do it. And the other challenge is to, is to keep track and apply the correct recovery operation at the end of this procedure. So how do we address, so addressing this first issue, how do we sample from the Clifford group? Is that hard? So what is the Clifford group? If you don't uh, know, the Clifford group is a set of operators that transform poly operators to other poly operators. Uh, take for example, the Hadamard gate, which is uh, one in, in the one qubit Clifford group. So the Hadamard gate transforms the Y poly matrix by this procedure into a minus Y, and it tra transforms the X into, into a Z. Right, so this is an example of a gate inside of this group. But for one qubit, uh, for the one qubit cases, there are 24 such gates. And as cube, as groups go, uh, there are nice symmetries in this structure. So this is this is what they look like with the vertices corresponding to rotation axes around the block sphere. But for two qubits, it's uh, over 11,000, and for three, it's 93 million. Uh, so it's not easy uh, to generate. Uh, this, to sample from this group for uh, large systems as well. But of course, there's many tricks uh, and symmetries and other things you can use, but this is an, an, an area of active research. So it's, it's not trivial. But uh, let's see how to run RB uh, on a superconducting qubit in QA. So we have these two loops at the top of the program. Uh, one is for the repetitions we need for getting statistics, and the other is for iterating over the different circuit depths. And then we have uh, this first macro that generates the random circuit for a requested depth. And this is done at runtime. It's not done before the circuit is played. And I'll show you in a bit the control structure that enables this. And once the circuit is generated, you also know which recovery gate is needed. The next step here is to append the recovery gate to the list of operations. Uh, and, um, and because QA supports lists, I mean, uh, arrays, vectors, at real time, uh, uh, you can do that very nicely. I mean, you just uh, kind of access, access um, a vector as you would in, in, say, Python. And then what you do is you play the generated circuit. And finally, at the end, what you do is measure the reflected signal, get uh, the qubit state, and, and move on. So how do you? Uh, another trick you can use uh, is to use uh, this uh, that you can use when working with groups in general. And this is to use uh, the Cayley table to save the gates and to uh, keep track of how they transform one state to another. So a Cayley table is simply a way to write all the possible products of a group's elements in a square table. So this is the Cayley table for the group minus one, one under multipl multiplication. You don't have many options here. But with uh, the, these 24 gates for the one qubit, uh, one qubit uh, uh, Clifford group, 
you get this, this table here. And we now can take advantage of knowing this structure and the, the fact that we have real-time variables in Kwani, we can save this to, to memory and, and, and use this to transform this our state in real time. And we do this by simply selecting the correct element from the table. So we can see this by diving into the generate sequence macro. You can see that we first store the table in memory and then do the state tracking here by uh, accessing the correct place in the array. So the current state's variable uh, is this real-time variable, which is assigned the value uh, in this assign. Assign is the equal sign of the qua world. And it corresponds to the current state of the table plus some random offset. And this is how we select at random as is required from the algorithm. So this is a nice, another nice feature that we can see at this stage. The variable rand is populated using a pseudo random number generator that runs on our hard hardware. Okay, so one last piece of the puzzle is that I said before, I'll show you how we actually play these gates one by one and avoid the problem of synthesizing everything ahead of time. Well, once we have a list of gates generated, we simple, simply iterate it using this for loop. And then we play just the gate that uh, is at that place in the sequence by using this switch case. Uh, so it plays the chosen gates in order and on the fly. You're not uploading anything as you're just telling the hardware what needs to, it needs to play one gate at a, at a time. So switch case is a new feature in Python uh, 3.10. Uh, which just came out. So we're quite proud of the fact that Qua had this even before Python did. So to summarize, here are the main control ch challenges in implementing RB and how we tackle them in Qua. So instead of uploading everything ahead of time, we synthesize and randomize as we go. Uh, we track the state and recovery operation using real-time variables. This is the scaly table business. And we play the circuit gate by gate using some useful flow control. So we can take this long story back to where we started with trapped ions. Uh, we went over code for a superconducting qubit and this code had a bunch of specialized logic for the algorithms at hand. But, uh, we can, but the question is, can we take this code written for a superconducting qubit and port it to an ion-based quantum computer in a similar way to let's say porting a computer game between uh, x86 and an ARM CPU? And the, the answer is yes, we can do that because the only place where the, Q, uh, clip, where the qubit specific logic is present is in the implementation of Clifford's and in the readout. And the rest is almost identical. So this means you can leverage the work done in general for practically any qubit type. And some of this work can be quite involved but completely platform and independent. Uh, consider all I said about the Cayley table, for example, it has nothing to do with superconducting qubits but everything to do with some abstract mathematical structure. So I hope you're convinced that Qua gives a great shortcut to developing quantum control code, and that there is a true case for having a language that works across platforms. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, and I think this point I'm done. And the next session, in the next session, we, as we discussed, we will talk both about quantum error correction and we'll see how the, the QOP uh, provides, a, 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 again, a highly programmable, programmable solution that allows exploring quantum error correction protocols um, in a very productive way. And then uh, the second talk will be about variational quantum algorithms and how the QOP gives uh, a solution that can optimize those as well.